Okay, oh, then we're going to continue chapter 12, part 2, for angle measurement. So, reliability with a universal beaver protractor. Um, here is just a general checklist in this table. And I'm just trying to tell you how to care for your protractor. Okay, you will think about mechanical conditions, and you're going to think about positional and then the observational considerations. So I'm not going to read everything and just uh, go ahead and uh, I'll read that. If you know that we should be careful mechanical, positional, and observational, um, that's okay. Okay, to uh, maintain the reliability with your instrument, your Bebo protractor. So for care, before use, you do the same thing, your cleaning, okay, your examinations and your calibrations then for doing the use you know, make sure um you don't do these things okay keep and do some of the things so do a uh, keep case nearby so that the instrument may be placed in case rather than on hard surface when not being used okay to uh protect to protect the protractor so you won't get nicks and scratches on it Avoid excessive handling to minimize your heat transfer. Do not slide along abrasive surfaces. Do not over tighten the clamps. Do not spring or bend by over constraint. Take precautions to avoid dropping instrument and to avoid dropping objects on it and avoid work near the heat sources. After use, you're going to do this. You're going to clean again. And don't use a compressed air um, because we, it could uh, drive particles into instruments. Dip it in a solvent, shake it dry if exposed to cutting fluids. Lubricate moving parts because every equipment needs lubrication to be uh, perfectly maintained. Apply this rust preventive lubricant and also replace in the case. Trigonometric functions, your review, they are formed by the sites, okay, of your triangle, and they are among the more useful tools in the practical angle measurement. We use trigonometry function or trig function to measure the angles. So the trig functions are your review, sine is your opposite divided by hypotenuse, okay, hypotenuse is the longest site of your triangle. The opposite is the opposite side of the angle of your measuring. The adjacent side is adjacent side of the angle you're measuring. So cosine, okay, adjacent if that is angle A, adjacent side divided by hypotenuse, tangent, opposite side divided by adjacent side. Okay. We're concentrating angle A right here. So sine A is going to be opposite divided by hypotenuse. Cosine A is your adjacent divided by hypotenuse. And your tangent A is your opposite divided by your adjacent. Okay. The use of tangents and one of the trigonometric functions used in practical angle measurement is your tangent. So here is your figure and it's showing you how to get tangent value by solving the fractions formed by the heights and the diameters differences. So then the angle can be looked up in your trig table, okay? So here is a pretty messy, so you have to go slow to take a look at it. So here, you're going to take a look at it very carefully, and this is the angle that we want to measure. And we call that angle desire, okay, in this part. And we're going to set up the measurement by using gauge blocks. Also, the measuring roads, okay? It's pretty hard to measure the angle, so your setup got to be right. And this distance from um, the row of the site to that site is going to be D. And then height from here all the way to the row is this H1, okay? And this is your reference surface. And the height from here to here, H2, the distance from here to here, is your D2, okay? So now we're going to put everything together and extract the triangle out so now you get c which is this so here we have a little triangle 
came and that's your hypotenuse and this is your h1 okay which is this side so we're flipping this triangle and this little one okay and that's your d2 minus d1 which is d2 is from here all the way to here okay and then d1 is from here to here divided by 2 is going to give you this little okay uh, opposite side and then the, that side is your hypotenuse which is this one so the angle equal to the desired angle okay so which is the desired angle is this one on this side and we're looking at the flip side which is this little one okay so when you take a look at the parallel line so you will see this two parallel line okay and we will use the parallel property of the two lines and these two angles are the same yeah so since we want to measure this angle right there the flip triangle on the other side with the parallel line is going to give you this little one right there okay so try take some time and then put your uh your parallel okay, lines and then your four angles remember so every time you see a parallel line you have to understand that you're seeing the two lines relationship which can be applied directly to a circle so therefore you can use all the properties of the same angles uh, through the vertices okay so uh, that's how you, you've got to be able to see that so make sure you read the handouts and read the uh, presentation and try to link the information together and that's going to take some time for you so uh, please take time to study so your tangent a is going to be your site the opposite site divided by your adjacent site okay you can go on uh, site opposite or site adjacent it's the same thing and so the site opposite is this little one, so d2 minus d1 divided by 2 is your distance. And then the other one is your site adjacent is this little one, which is h2 minus h1. Okay, so we're looking at this angle. So that opposite site in this adjacent side, this little angle is the same as that angle because these two lines are parallel to each other. All right, the use of sine. So the sine of the angle abbreviated, we, we use this unit S-I-N, case symbol, and the pronounced sine is one of the most powerful and useful measurements. So we apply sine, okay, to a variety of situations, uh, such as manufacturing, inspection, sub-microscopic research, so and so. So here in this example, you can see the importance of set up okay using trigonometry to find the angle setting up is nothing but we're trying to find a triangle especially the right triangle so that we can be able to use a trig function to get the measurement of that angle so from the figure the measured triangle produces 7.856 and 2.750 for the two sides okay So how do we get the measurement of the two sides? We're going to set it up, okay, the parts that we want to mesh up, and then you measure linear measurement, and then you will get that too. Then we are going to approach to get this angle, okay? So here, our desired angle is this, and we're going to use these two sides, and we're going to use the trigonometry function to find it. Okay, so after we get the two sides measurement, we're going to use it. So here, the opposite side is 2.750. Your hypotenuse measurement is 7.856. And you're going to divide the opposite with your hypotenuse, and you'll get your sine, and that's 0 0.3501. Then we're going to go to the natural function, which is your table. We call it the trick table, because we can read the measurement of the angles out of it by using the ratios, okay, the values of your ratios. So 0 0.3501 divided by 
lies between 0 0.34993 and 0 0.35021, okay? So it shows the angle is between 20 degree, 29 minutes, and 20 degree, 30 minutes, okay? So in between that two. So you can also do the interpolation by trying to find 3501 lies closer to here or closer to there, okay? By dividing, uh, try to find the midpoint. And then locate this is on that side or on this side. And you can be able to uh, round it to the nearest minute. Then we will get into sign bars and plates. So the sign bar uh, looks like that. Can okay, that help us learn something about the angles? So a sign bar is just made of steel and it has a solid cylinder near each end, okay, like this little one right there. It's just a 2D right here. You can see the sign bar metrological and functional features. You have attachment hose and you have convenient center distance and you have plugs or cylinders at the end. Metrological, we know this, okay, as your reference surface and that's your known surface distance. And this one is your center line right there at the center of cylinders parallel to the reference surface. So the sine bar is already the hypotenuse of a triangle, okay, frozen in steel with a lamp selected to a minimized computation. So every time you use the sine bar, you're getting the hypotenuse. Okay, so the sine bar forms a hypotenuse of site adjacent. So you can take a look at this figure. So site adjacent is a site of angle adjustment. Uh, angle adjacent to the measuring um, angle. So here is your hypotenuse. Sometimes this can be your site adjacent or adjacent site. This can also be um, the site opposite. Okay. So the sine bar usually forms a triangle with a hypotenuse of five inches and the side opposite is your opposite side of the desired angle is a difference in the height of the cylinder support okay so that's how we get um the measurement of the two sides as soon as you have two sides you can be able to get the opposite desired um angle so the sign bar measurement variables are your geometric your mechanical and your set up so these are the three sources of error, okay, that should be recognized when using the sign bar. Geometric parallelism of working surface to the center line of your cylinders. Squareness of the axis of the cylinders to the instrument. This is your cylinders. The roundness of your cylinders, okay. So these are error that you, you can get from geometry. For mechanical error is in the center to center distance, differences in the cylinder diameters, and surface imperfections like the insufficient flatness or working surface. Okay, flatness or working surface. Now your setup is your error into sets of height supports, and your setup is your imperfect reference surface as well. Okay, then we're going to use the side bar to measure the angle opposite to side 1.750 and then adjacent to the side, which is your sine bar, that's a 5, okay, 0 0.000 of the triangle form from the part being measured. So by using the sine bar, we get 5 inches. And this is our set up. The height, 3.5. This is 5.25. And we have 5, 3.5, 5.25, okay. So we draw this from the setup. In measurement, we're forming a triangle now. So you have your hypotenuse of 5. And you have your height is 1.750. How did you get it? Oh, you uh, subtract it, okay. And where is this location? It's just right there, yeah. So you're taking this out of that. So you're getting this little triangle. You exaggerate it in your drawing and you can see the sides. And now you're going to take this too, okay? And you would go right here. 
Okay, here we have 1.750, the opposite side of your desired angle. This is not the same trigonometry table, it's different because this is only for the 5 inches sign bar table. Okay. So you don't have to calculate the ratio. You can read directly from the measurement of your opposite uh, opposite side okay? or side opposite of this angle. So when you take a look at 1.750, it's closer to 0 0.7496. Okay. So therefore you get 20 degree, 29 minute. This is only trying to do the interpolation. Interpolation is nothing but you take a look at this two number and try to find the midpoint okay, of that two number. You can add it, divide it by two, and you will get the midpoint. Okay, locate this, whether that is going to be closer to there or that is going to be closer to this side. And you will round the angle. Okay, so here 1.750 is on the other side. So therefore we get 20 degree right here, 29 minutes. Okay, so very little computation is required by using the table and the sign bar. So it gets faster because you are skipping the calculation of your either sine, tangent, or cosine by using the ratio, trig ratio, okay? So we, we're very intelligent in a shortcutting. <laughs> so scientists are very smart. Smart people are very lazy. They always think about how to cut, how to cut steps. So um, that's how we cut the steps so you can save time to be able to get the same angle, okay? Okay, calculation of 5 inch sine bars. So 5 inches, 12.7 centimeter was chosen for sine bars standard instrument because it's easy to compute or do calculation with 5. Okay, so to set a 5 inch or 12.7 centimeter sine bar to an angle, you have to look up the sine in the table of natural functions and I'll move the decimal point one place to the right and divide it by 2. So the result is the height of your triangle. So to find the angle when you know the height difference, move the decimal point one place to the left, multiply by 2, and look up the result in the table. So for example, you know, figure uh, 1261, your height is 1.750. Okay, now you're going to move the decimal one place to the left, so we get 0 0.1750. So we are moving this little decimal, okay, to the left. So you get 0 0.1750 times 2, okay, multiply by 2. So we get 0 0.350. You're going to take it to the sign table, and you will end up getting 20 uh, degree and 29 minute for that. Okay, this is just a short rule. Um, move the decimal point left or right, then multiply by 2 to get sine, divide by 2 to get the angle. Okay, so the sine ball constant factors are shown right here. Based on 100 millimeter sine bar constant, this is based on 5 inch or regular sine bar constant. So if you're using 50 millimeter sine bar, you're going to multiply with 0 0.50. 125 multiply with 1.25. 200 multiply with 2. 500, you're going to multiply with 5. If you use a 5 inch, 2.5 inch sine bar, multiply with 0 0.5, 3, 0 0.6, 4, 0 0.8, 10, multiply with 2, and then 20 multiply with constant 4, okay? So many sign bars, they use the center distances other than 5 inch. So obviously an error in setting a 10 inch sign bar will cause half the inaccuracy in the measurement. That would be 
uh, caused by the same error with a 5 inch sign bar. Okay, so doing a comparison measurement by using your sign bar. So for comparison measurement, the sign bar is used to cancel out the angle being measured. So the precision of the measurement depends on the sensitivity of the instrument, okay, used in the measurement. So for comparison measurement, the sign bar is used to cancel out the angle being measured so you can detect any deviation by measuring the parallelism be between the part feature and the reference surface. So here you can see we use the sign bar, we use the indicator and the stand right there, and then this is the part that we're trying to measure. And here we also use the gauge blocks okay, to stand the sign bar against the part. So this what we call it a setup. So what we're trying to do is to get the triangle, okay? Here in figure 12.6.5, you want to see three types of sign bars, and we extensively use them. So A, so A, uh, you have a non, uh, not supporting interference at the vertex end right there. And B, when you take a look at it, the interference um, at sign and for the angles. But in C, we don't have interference at either end, okay? So the evolution is going from A all the way to C. Here is your sign plate, and it's just a sign block, okay, with a attachment base. So this is your base, and that's your block, which is your sign plate. So your sign blocks, your sign plates, and the sign tables. We use them to measure angles. So sign bar has evolved from some obvious designs that are still used because they are low in cost and convenient. So a sign plate is a sign block with an attached base. Okay. So if you think about a sign plate, we know there is a base. The tolerance of sign instruments. So here in this table are the typical tolerances for quality sign bars sign blocks and sign plates this is just a trying to uh, show you what the bar and the sounder okay uh, sizes are and then your commercial and the lab class using the complement of angles right here so as the angle being measured increases so we're going to measure this is 320 40, 60, 80, so 90. So the angle being measured increases, the precision of your sign measurement decreases. Okay, so the sign is a result of dividing, remember from the little angle, sign the desired angle of uh, the sign of the desired angle is the site opposite or opposite side divided by a hypotenuse. The way a hypotenuse is always the same for a particular sign instrument. Okay, here is the two setup. So in A, you can see the indicator shows that the outer parallel condition is 0 0.005 in 2 inches. It's just measuring along the surface. And B, it reads the same. So at 1 degree, okay, the side opposite or opposite side is extremely small compared with the hypotenuse. So therefore, the sign is very, very small. So when we increase the angle, okay, by uh, 1 degree from 1 degree to 2 degree, the sign nearly doubles to 0 0.03490, so which is comparatively large increase. So in figure, when you look at it, the reading in both cases, it does not show the angles have been read with precision because the parallelism, okay, uh, change at the steep angle and does not represent nearly the same angle change as it does in the complement angle. I just are trying to tell you because the setup is different, even though the readings are showing you the same thing. Okay, this two setup has a flaw because um, they it, it doesn't show the angles. Okay, have been read with a precision. That's why you're getting uh, some error right here. 
Okay, then we're going to measure the angle in a different way. This time, we're going to use a gauge blocks. So when gauge blocks are used, you'll have to use two or more gauge blocks in stack because sometimes the sign of the angle being measured could be smaller than the thinnest gauge block. So we're using not the regular gauge block, we'll be using the angle gauge block. Okay, so to compromise, square gauge blocks are used whenever they are available. So gauge blocks are recommended to use between the lower cylinder and the reference surface. Um, so this can definitely minimize the errors used uh, caused by surface imperfections and a compressibility of the reference surface. So when heavy setup are made, double stacks of gauge blocks are used. So here in 1270, you can see the comparator does not know the difference between A and the, the setup B, so except for the errors caused by the two setups. So here, when you pay attention, you're going to see the surface imperfections. You also see the compression of the surface. Okay. Now in B, you have additional contact. So here, see the difference right there, additional contact. And we also have additional ringing interval, okay, observation error, and you also have a selection error right in there. So what we're trying to do, like we say here, you're going to use a gauge block in order to minimize these errors, okay. Compound angles. So compound angles are a little bit different from the regular angles because they are formed by edges of triangles that lie in different planes. So we have many different uh, triangles, okay, and they are uh, set up in a way that they are connected through the planes. So if these triangles lie in different planes, they define the boundaries of solid, real, or imaginary, and their edges are the intersections of these planes. So in this pyramid, you can see there are four sets okay, of face angles. So three around each point, A, B, C, and D. So we have A, you have one, two, and then three. Okay, face angle. Another three face angle at point B. Another three at D. And another three at point C. Okay, for this A, B, C triangle pyramid. So altogether, 4 times 3, you have 12, yeah, face angles. So here in on 12, uh, 7, 2, it's going to show you a dihedral angle, another review from your middle or high school. So which is an opening between the two intersecting planes. So the plane angle is the angle between the sides, okay, are in two intersecting planes perpendicular to the plane or intersection at the same point. So angle, you're going to look right there, C, and then D, and then E. Okay, so right here, that little one. So dihedral angle is this opening, okay, between the two planes. So in figure 1273, there are six plane angles. So plane angles are more efficient means for defining the shape of a solid than the face angles. So we deal with the plane angles when we're machining solid figures or measuring them. So every compound angle can be totally subdivided. So some combination of five or uh, two or five types of angles will form from every compound angle, okay? So we can see right here in 74, Petro, in order to find the compound angle, okay, most solid figures reduce to one of these five types. So you can reduce it to different shapes, okay? And we can be able to form the compound angle. Again, compound angle, if you think about it, you can think about the planes. Planes are forming the angles, okay? At the intersecting points. Okay, so all compound angles, we can reduce them to simple angles, providing that adequate reference surfaces are located. So here in this picture, okay, you can see the compound angles are reduced to simple angles, uh, providing the adequate reference surfaces 
are located. So here it's a little bit difficult to see. I have to go slow, okay, in order for you to be able to see the triangles, okay. So here we're reducing, see how you can see this little triangle right there. And then on this side, this little triangle, which is right here, okay. So that's how we uh, uh, reduce to simple angles. From the compound angles. Okay, so compound sine angle plate looks like that. So when two sine angle plates are superimposed, the base creates one plane, okay, and the top creates a second plane. So that's how we can see the two planes by uh, using the superimposed method. So the plane angle is formed by the intersection of the two sine plates. So it's neither of the angles set in the separate section. So here, compound sine angle plate, metrological features, you carefully look at it. So this is your plane angle right here, okay? So that is happening between the intersection of these two planes. So here is your hinge line, and that's another hinge line. Angles always form between two lines, and this is your 90 degree. So here in 1277, it's showing you a typical compound single angle plate, and it looks in real life like that. And it's used to form compound angle as extensively as it is used to measure them, okay? All right, 1278 is your sine device. So this sine device is another device to measure angle and is used in machine tools until finishing operation where sine plates is used. So sine angle plates are used more in machining angles as in measuring angles, okay, making angles, machining. Is. Okay, so mechanical angle measurement. So there are a few instruments used in mechanical indexing angle measurement. So they are dividing heads Indexing and nothing but we're using the dividing heads. So indexing heads or index heads. So that's how we call them. So they're just devices that are developed for machining the angles rather than again measuring them. So the dot index head is an index head with one power, one x only. So therefore it has limited practical application. So a horizontal spindle mounted on a base that rests on a surface, a reference surface, okay. So here you can see a dial, okay, index. We use them to machine the angle. Okay, here is your dial index head capability, and you can see the discrimination, sensitivity, and accuracy, depending on the method of graduation. And we can go by graduation, so we can go by the index plate. Okay, for all these factors. So the index uh, head, especially the dial index head capability, um, they usually go with the typically design and the amount of wear, and uh, that depends on the manufacturers, okay? So the capability, depending on the design, depending also on the amounts of wear, and you can be able to see the differences between their discrimination, sensitivity, and accuracy, okay? Depends on these methods of operations. So figure 8.1 is this, and it's showing you the measurement using the index head influenced by two independent variables. So one is your index uncertainty, and the other one is your slot width uncertainty. Again, Again, the errors, okay, so dot index head lacks discrimination when index plate is used and lacks sensitivity when graduations are used in the measurement. Okay. So what, what it's trying to tell you is if you use the index plate, so the dial index head is, is going to lack the discrimination. And if you use the graduations in your measurement, it's going to lack your sensitivity. So vernier scales, micrometer screw, gear, worm, and the microscope, we can use them, okay, to add to the dial index head for amplification of your measurement. So 
So here you don't really have to know any of this one if you can be able to understand that you know for clarity the die index head k is you can see it right here because of the way that they draw it in the sequence operation steps so the deviation read by the indicator is going to contain both the index error and the slot width error okay so if you get this um, we're pretty okay with that so the plane index head is another angle measurement. So here the dia index head with mechanical amplification has evolved into the plane index head. So the plane index head is going to start at 2x amplification and can provide a disc discrimination of 40x. So one a warm and a gear are added to it. So here this is your road a re-index table, another angle measurement. So a rotary index table is just a, um, a variety of index head construction, okay, to set your angle. So metrology or mechanical indexing. So mechanical index heads, they were developed for the needs of the shell and they are rough, definitely. Okay, to withstand the forces of your machining. So we, because we're machining the anger anyway. So the accuracy of index head is started as the total accumulative error. So indexing is like stepping off of the circle with a divider. So the precision of the index head is defined as the fitness to which we can set it to the angles or the extent to which the head can divide the circle which depends on the gear ratios, okay? Measurements to seconds of arc. So seconds and angle measurement are used only in precision measurement as in astronomy, okay? In the development, production, launch, and recovery of missiles and shuttles. We also use it in the erection of very, very large and high-speed machinery, such as your paper mail. So when you take a look at it here, I'm just trying to show you what the arc is. So here is your arc uh, minutes. Okay, so beta is equal to 31 arc minutes. So that's all you see from your eye. And when you take a look at the moon, we always have an angle, okay, from our point of, of vision. So that angle, we call that the arc minutes. So one degree is 60 arc minutes. Okay, so one arc minute is 60 arc seconds. So in astronomy, a second sweeps through the expanse of your space. So for example, one angular second on Earth is going to sub tens to more than one mile on the moon, okay? Because uh, the distances are very far away, but then our eyes are still very powerful because you can be able to see the moon, okay? That is so, so far away from the Earth. And that's because of uh, the angle that our eyes can be able to uh, to make okay within our vision because our vision is 180 degree that you can be able to um, see and you also have a your uh, when you get to here you're going to have a blind spot right there so right off of the blind spot is your vision zone so that's going according to your angle okay and we can also measure in that way so anyway, so back to astronomy. So we use, okay, seconds of arc is only for the precision measurement. So we measure the angle by using degree, minute, second is the finest, okay, the finest angle measurement. And we deal with all these sophisticated measurements. All right, so angle measurement with gauge blocks. We also use a gauge block to measure the angles but they're not like the linear gauge okay we're using the angle gauge and uh, they can be used to add and also to subtract when you take a look at this here you can be able to see we're using two blocks one is so 30 okay the other one is five so when you add them you get 35 degree okay and here 30 degree and that's a minus five so when you add them together you get 25 degree angle. Okay, so that's how we use the gauge. You only need about 10 angle gauge blocks uh, to be able to measure the angle combinations. 
then we can definitely form about eight angles with two gauge blocks. So the four gauge blocks are also very useful. So the 16 block set is shown in figure 1285, but blocks are available in sets of 11 for one minute of arc discrimination and six. So for one degree, okay, discrimination. Okay, so accuracy, precision, and angle measurements are the three general methods of angle measurement. The very first one is your mechanical indexing with a dividing head. The second one is your divided scale with a vernier protractor. And the third one is your comparison with angle gauge blocks. So these are all your methods for angle measurement. So here in this picture, you can be able to see your rotary tables. Okay, they're also the familiar way to uh, uh, to set the angles. So here you have your rotating surface. That's your functional feature for rotary tables. And the physical strength to support part loads. So here is your mounting plate. And then this is your amplification readout. And here is your provisions for indexing and also locking. So metrological, this here is our centering error. And the type of readout is right there, and the scale discrimination and linearity is right here, and your parallelism or rotating to mounting the plates. It's a pretty uh, useful okay, instrument to measure angle. So no matter how accurate the scales are, the accuracy may be degraded by the tab tables, eccentricity, okay, rotary table, eccentricity. So we get Centricity when the center of revolution of the table is not exactly in the center of the scale and it doubles the error. So when you take a look at it here, eccentricity, okay, error rises and falls with your rotation. So repeating itself every 360 degree. So here are your eccentricity and that's your index. And here is your minimum error at zero degree. Going on to 90 degree, you start to get error. 180 degree more error and 270 the error go back down and 360 degree we can see the minimum error again okay so it's going like a little wave right here but we can use a reverse effect to cancel out the error so that's how we're going to fix it so by placing two indices 180 degree apart okay we can determine the readings and average them so that they cancel the error. So here the eccentricity may be canceled out okay, by the reversal process. So two observations. So we're going to start right here with uh, zero. And then we have 180 degree apart, have equal error, but they have opposite signs. So you can see this is plus and then that is minus and they can be cancelled out. So the simple direct reading rotary table measures only two, uh, two degrees um, because that's the biggest okay, angle measurement unit. So when we add a calibrated okay, lead screw drive, we can take readings to one second of arc with a claim indexing accuracy of plus or minus 10 seconds. So we're making uh, the precision measurements and uh, trying to bring the degree to the finest second of arc. So the low precision table, not the high precision table, uh, in, uh, is a more accurate one. Okay. Meaning like when you uh, choose your rotary table, make sure you go for the low precision table because it's more accurate. So the caliper principle. So with the caliber principle, we compare the divisions with each other. So you gotta remember how we use the caliber, yeah. Interchange methods. So until we have established the number and the uniformity we need, okay. So first when you look at this 1290, we're gonna see the caliber principle. And caliber principle is we're comparing the division against each other. So here is your first position. You have your A and B that's one and two. So that's 180 degree division in the second division. So we have 180 divisions right there. And that's your error, okay? 
here is your point one, and your two, and then your three. So the uniform divisions are found by comparing divisions against each other. So the caliper principle can be used in 90 degree division or any number of uniform divisions. So here are your first position, one, two, and then three. Okay, and that's your 90 degree division. And this is your second division. So one, two, and then three, and then four here. If you have a hard time trying to read it, so this is your 180 degree division. See, so how this is kind of a little bit off. This 180 degree got to be straight line. So that's how we are finding the error. Okay, that's a difference. So it's a little bit off from your 180 degree division. Okay, so we're doing uh, comparing these divisions so that you can be able to get um, the right angle, which is your 180 degree. So here is again, 90 degree should be like this. So the perfect line is right there in the middle, but the reality is that three or four. So meaning you have a division error right in there, okay? So the degree grads and gons are your units. So they are, there are two approaches to simplify computation with angles. The very first one is replacing the entire conventional system and then de decimalize some part of the current angle computation system. So some scientists want to get credits and also those who work outside want to get credits. So everyone want to get credits and they compete each other. So in order for them to be able to do that, they try to get rid of the conventional system and try to insert their own unit or unit system, okay? So that's what I'm trying to tell you on uh, that. So like you know, America is a capital, capitalism. Uh, we practice that in uh, democracy. So the power is in the hand of people. And it is not by the government, it is by the people. And one thing is good is, uh, um, it's kind of like unloading the responsibility, okay? Another thing is not good, you think that isn't good, is you have too many competitions, and you also have too many rules. And you have to be incredibly flexible to be able to survive in these differences between the people who are holding that power. So you're not being afraid or being conformed to only one rule. You are conforming to different kinds of rules made by many different businesses and many different influential people, okay? Or the majority of the people, and they're going with their own rules. So that's the chaos that we're seeing even in the scientific area. Um, especially in the science area because they're not conforming uh, with the unit systems or anything okay so if you go into small medium and uh, large businesses they are dealing with their own rule that is formed inside of their own company so that's how they hold the divided power in the country okay but that puts a lot of stress and strains on the people as well because the people got to be superhero and you have to be incredibly uh, flexible to be able to fit into any kind of company. Okay, you got to pick that rule up and you have to be compatible to any of the rules that they will be making for you. So uh, it's good and bad at the same time. Okay, um, it's good that people have the power. It is bad that you have to be afraid of a lot of the people who have that power. So when you apply yourself, okay, to work at different companies, you have to be incredibly flexible, okay? Otherwise, you won't fit in. So therefore, try to be okay with diversity. Try to be okay with any kinds of rules. And you have to get it quick. You have to get it quick as soon as you get into their environment, okay? And that's the secrets of success in the United States. It's, uh, you can be a rigid person. If you are rigid, it's very difficult to fit into many different kinds of environment.
Okay, let's get back uh, to degree grad and gone. So when a full cycle is divided into 400 parts, by using the lines, and we're going to divide, okay, the cycle has a lot of points along the line, uh, circumference, and you can uh, draw the lines across the center of your circles, and we're going to do the 400 parts. So each part, we're going to call that a grad, okay, originally called the grade. So the grade is evolved, and now we are calling it grad by getting rid of E at the end or silent silent it. So these divisions are convenient because 100 grads is going to equal to your right angle because we have four right angles in a circle. So radian. Radian is the SI matrix system. Okay. So for angle measurement used along with the uh, star radian and also grad, you can see in some of the major labs uh, company also use only the British system, okay, just going with a degree. Some of them use a radian, but most likely you will see in you know, all national labs or labs, okay. The private labs, again, they go on with their own rules and units, and they're very loose, by the way. And sometimes you have to study them because you don't understand or cannot be able to match it with what you learn the standard units from the textbook. So the radian is the angle whose arc and length equals its radius. And it's defined as 180 degree divided by pi. Okay, this is your pi symbol. That's how we read the pi in grads, the 200 divided by pi. So one radian is this degree, that minutes, and this seconds, and that much of grads. So one degree is, again, this much of radians, all right? Gon is a new unit, and uh, grad was changed to gone, especially in the European trade literature and SI tables. Uh, so when gone is pi divided by 200 radians, 0 0.9 degrees, okay, 54.0 minutes, and 3,240 seconds. So 1 k okay, milli gone is 3.240 seconds. This is just to try and show you how the 180 degree is equal to 3.14 radians, which is your pi. Okay, angle to linear and then linear to angle measurement conversion tables. Uh, right now we have automatic conversion, so you most likely don't have to do it by hand, but this is what uh, these people use in uh, in, in, in the former generations, uh, these tables, and they have to use it to uh, calculate by hand, okay? So here is uh, your angle, one second, so if you go by per inches, is that per, uh, per 10 inches is going to be this. And then linear measurement is the same thing, that you can be able to convert, okay, from here to there and that to here. So anyway, just uh, take a look at that. Okay, so this is the end of chapter 12.